Hi, everybody. I'm pleased to have Trip Hawkins, video games industry legend, with us here today. And Trip, it was really great to see you on the Netflix documentary High Score. Thank but, you. Uh, and I'll, I'll ask you about that. But in terms of like some of the news happening, you know, today in terms of Unity and all this other stuff, do you have any thoughts in terms of the industry today? You know, the game industry is bigger than ever. It's obviously doing well because uh, people are um, in, indoors at home a bit more. My uh, teenage son likes to say the best side is the inside. There's a whole lot of us that are introverts that enjoy spending our time uh, playing games and, you know, being at home on the Internet. Uh, but uh, it's a great time for the industry uh, from a longer term standpoint. It's it's uh, a very strong and healthy industry. And it's really becoming more of like social media. I think people more than anything are turning to games to connect with people and to, uh, you know, have uh, shared experiences and have it be a form of uh, social networking. I give Fortnite a lot of credit for, you know, being a, a big uh, mover in that direction. But uh, you mentioned uh, Unity, both Unity and Skills, another mobile company have, uh, started the process of filing to go public and that's pretty exciting we haven't had a, a couple of big mobile game ipos in a in a while and just asking about high score that was a fantastic documentary by netflix that you were profiled in and it does a great job of kind of going over some of the seminal events and major innovations in the games industry but from your perspective looking back what did high score leave out you know, it's very funny. I, I, I love the show. The production style is, is fantastic. They do a lot of fun things with uh, graphics to supplement the interviewing. And, you know, they, they have it very much looking like a video game, which is fun to see yourself uh, pixelated and presented uh, in that way. But uh, I think they chose to spotlight things that, that were humorous and that maybe... Uh, uh, had value in terms of the narrative arc uh, that they had mapped out. And I was really glad to see uh, some uh, spotlights in areas that don't usually get a lot of attention. But uh, the funny thing is, it made it sound like the whole story about Madden had to do with this moment in a uh, 25 conversation I had with John the first time I met him while we're sitting on a train for you know three days crossing America. <laughs> And there was this uh, one moment where I'd, I'd had this 100-page design document that I'd put together, and I had a bunch of questions. I just asked him what he thought about having a, which is called skeleton. You know, it's something you actually do in football practice a lot because the uh, offensive linemen are off pushing around blocking sleds with each other, and the uh, rest of the player, who are the uh, uh, position players, are you know running plays and running pass patterns and doing stuff like that and you can pretty much do skeleton have it heck of a lot like actual football right. I was a little nervous about whether or not we could do 11 on 11 with 8-bit technology so i brought it up i wasn't sure it was uh, a viable thing to do anyway some number of years ago espn wrote a story where they made it like it was a big deal and that my idea and i was really pushing for it and then john no <laughs> Anyway, you turn it into this great drama, like it's a big deal. It was really kind of a nothing, but it, but now it's been made into a famous something. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm able to laugh at myself about it. It's no big deal. But the, the, the bigger underlying story that it doesn't come out in Netflix's documentary is that Electronic Arts, at my direction, we had reverse engineered the Sega Genesis. Right. We, were made, we were able to make our own games and have complete freedom on the platform without a license. And at, at the 11th hour before our uh, first set of games came out, we uh, actually got together with Say and worked a really fantastic deal that us to have a license but not be really restricted and really not have to pay for it. And so it just set up EA to have uh, the fabulous future that it has had. And it allowed EA to invest heavily and making games for the Sega Genesis, including Madden Football. And it was uh, uh, in that period where the company, uh, which was already a public company, and, it, and in fact, I, I took EA Blick when I did, specifically because I thought it would be a good idea to, to set some cash aside because I thought Sega was probably going to sue EA and we would have to spend a few years funding our defense to prove that we had done our reverse engineering correctly in a clean room and that we were able to legitimately make uh, Sega games. And of course, 
Monica found out that we were doing this, they threatened and they were huffing and puffing and trying to pull our house down. But in the end, I was able to negotiate a really fantastic uh, deal with them. And the value of electronic arts in a two year period, which is kind of highlighted by the uh, hyper uh, uh, segment, uh, the uh, first version of Madden for Sega Genesis in that time period, the value of the company was $60 million to $2 billion wow. in about two years. That's a pretty dramatic change in value. I mean, to have it go 30 times. And it was because we were cranking out all these really good, high quality sports and other kinds of games for the uh, Sega Genesis and the dominant supplier of games for the Sega Genesis. And in fact, Sega might have been in some trouble without us. And we were kind of neck and neck with Sega in terms of who's actually the biggest game supplier for the for the Sega platform, which is, that didn't really come out in the uh, entry. And of course, uh, the Madden game for Sega Genesis was uh, also immediately ported by the same developers into being the first hockey game that we had, which was also another big, big hit. Right. And then the last thing about that story that uh, uh, may have been covered but wasn't is that Sega had decided to make their own football game, and they had, they had a big promotional agreement with Montana, and they were they were using to promote the hardware, the software, the everything. But as part of that deal, let's make a Montana uh, towards uh, the uh, fall se uh, season in 1990, when uh, our Madden game was going to make its debut. Uh, Sega called me up and said, "Hey, uh, our Joe Montana game." It's not going to make Christmas. And well, our platform's going to do. And we've already uh, shot all these commercials with Montana and we're really promoting this game. And it could really hurt the platform if we don't have that game for Christmas. So, how, how would, you, would you be willing to cancel Madden football's release and instead convert that into something we can call Joe Montana football? Oh, wow. So they didn't, of course, mention that in the documentary because they, they never asked me about it. And, and of course, uh, ironically, I had some executives on my team that thought, oh, that's a that's a good idea because they're Sega. They've got all that marketing power, even though they're only going to give us a small fee per unit. Maybe we'll make more money. And I thought, no, that's ridiculous. Uh, that's totally not the case. So I actually went back to Sega and I said, look, so here's the deal. We're already committed to our brand, Madden Football. The game's finished. We're already booking orders. We're going to throw in that release. However, we will also make Montana football for you. And you have to write me a $2 million check and we'll have you the game in six weeks. And they said, okay. <laughs> I, went, I went to my uh, studio team and I said, okay, here's what we have to do. But I want to shrink the playbook from 135 plays to 13. I want to change the camera angle from fake 3D to a top-down uh, 2D with big head characters, which are very popular in Japan. And let's just, let's just make sure that our uh, Madden game, which this Montana thing is gonna be built on, let's make our Madden game is way better than the Montana game we're gonna give them. And, and it's, uh, make sure that it's a big secret that under the hood, it's, it's all the basically same uh, programming. And we cranked that out in six weeks. We got our two million bucks, and those two games were the were two of the five best-selling games for the Sega Genesis that Christmas. Oh wow! So Trip, I actually wanted to ask you in terms of you know you've been in the industry for a long time. When you look at like some of the current innovations and some of the things happening in the market, and let's say in twenty years, thirty years from now, if there's if they were making a new high score for the current industry. What do you think has a potential of becoming like the next big major innovation for the video games market? I think there's a few of them. Well, one marketplace that's already really dynamic and active and growing, it's certainly uh, annual business volume of over a billion dollars a year. That's esports. And it makes perfect sense to me because I, I have four children. I've, I've watched how they've grown up around all of media and their connections with brands and game brand, it's very different than mine. So when I was a kid, you know, it was pretty easy to uh, fall in love with traditional sports because that's kind of all we had. And, you know, some of my kids care about certain uh, real sports, but their, their biggest brands are video games. And it makes perfect sense to me that video game fans would like to see 
the best players play the games that they love and to watch that kind of elite level of competition. So there's obviously a huge broadcast audience and broadcast free for that led by Twitch and now many others. And there's quite a few conventional broadcasters that are involved. And then you have the audiences for the uh, superstar streamers like Ninja and uh, others like PewDiePie that post a lot of content on YouTube. And these guys have like a hundred million or more uh, followers. That's a really exciting trend. And one of the ways I look at games that games have become vertical market social media platforms. I think that was a, a big change, uh, really encouraged more than anything by Fortnite, basically looking at the shooter genre where you're supposed to kill other people. And they instead say, well, we're just going to turn it into a big party and we're going to do dance moves and have emotes, emotes. And that attracted, of course, a much larger audience. It kind of reminds me when I was a kid, I was a big fan of James Bond. And I thought that was what spies really did. I didn't find out until much later that it's a parody. That's how I think about Fortnite. It's kind of a parody. And everybody's having a lot of fun running around in a 10 foot tall pink bunny outfit or having a weapon that looks like a great white shark. I mean, it's just, they're having a good time with it. And they're, they're going into these games to meet up with their friends as squads. And again, that plays right into esports. Esports uh, is kind of long term, it'll be driven by games that involve squad play and teamwork and so on. So esports is a big deal. There's another really big theme that is uh, kind of related because as a, an overall statement about technology today, the cloud is everything. Right. You know, we've already seen it in a number of examples of things that are fundamental services that we, we use every day that have moved to the cloud, but it's going to become more and more and more of that led by the internet and that, uh, that are operating a lot of the backend cloud services. And it's a great thing for the game industry because there are all these value-added services now that as a game developer allow you to focus on the creativity around your game idea and then bring in things like payment, cloud services, and your, your content data network, uh, uh, network and uh, all, all of the other kinds of services, your 3D engine. You, know, you can basically outsource a lot of things. And it's enabling uh, all kinds of all over the world to have a chance to play games earlier in life, having access to devices and screens, to fall in love with games as something they want to do for the rest of their lives. And for many of them to end up becoming uh, professionals in the game industry or professional athletes in esports. And that's all going to get really big. But as we talk about things going to the cloud, uh, we, we are going to get to a point where you can have the hardware in the cloud do all the calculations about the game you're playing and just have your joystick sending instructions to the cloud uh, as your opponents are also doing and basically be cloud streaming the game. And then you don't actually have to buy customized hardware and you can just basically uh, play your session or screen you happen to have your standardized joystick and play against other. And, you know, they, again, uh, it, it's sort of a, a way to get sort of platform independence and even a greater level of convenience. And convenience is a really big theme that has been driving the game industry for a while. Uh, we uh, don't have to go to stores or we don't uh, have to really wait, whether you're going through the wireless cell phone network or you're uh, in front of a, a screen that's attached to the internet. You know, we can try things for free. We can try them right now. Uh, a lot of things are, are designed so that it's easy for all kinds of people to to be into them uh, smoothly and quickly. And uh, the audience is exploding and you know, we're moving up towards having 3 billion gamers. Right. And it just uh, goes to show that games are really mainstream now. It's not the kind of activity that used to be, uh, that it used to be where you were embarrassed to admit that you played games. And it was something where uh, you'd go down to your basement on a version of Grand Theft Auto for 50 hours. So it's, it's uh, exciting to look forward to these kinds of cloud services so it'll, it'll be a little bit like trying to be the Netflix of games. And I think you're going to end up seeing a big battle between some really big companies fighting over that uh, business model. And it'll probably result in some of the biggest acquisitions in the history of the industry. Right. And in terms of cloud gaming, do you think it is Google Stadia or do you think it's going to be something else? Uh, you have to have a back catalog. Right. And in addition to a back catalog, which helps me as a potential subscriber feel like, wow, there's always something to do. 
So you have to have some studio capacity, you have to have some exclusives, and you have to have uh, a depth. Right. And it's, it's a little bit of how uh, Netflix kind of positions what they have to offer that turn it on and you start looking at it, you realize, wow, look at all this stuff. Uh, the, the funny thing is they kind of obscure the fact that they don't have the new movie releases because uh, as of a few years ago, the movie companies decided they wanted to run their own services and compete with Netflix. So they're, they're, they're sure as heck not going to just easily give permission to Netflix. And Netflix occasionally gets something for a limited time period by paying a lot to, to have access to it. But uh, Netflix doesn't have everything. You know, they're, they're kind of the uh, evidence that okay, actually be successful without having everything. But uh, you better have something. You know, so Google doesn't have much of anything at the moment. You know, the guys that have big catalogs are guys like Sony and Microsoft. And they have good first party games for PlayStation and Xbox. But they also have their license agreements with their third party licensees that have made games for their platforms. And basically, if they want to restrict uh, those from going on to, say, a, a uh, or Xbox games or a Google Stadia for PlayStation games, they can easily do that. Uh, what's easy for Google to do and for any developer to do is to put their PC version on a service like Google Stadia. Right. But even there, uh, maybe a medium sized or larger uh, independent companies like Electronic Arts and Activision, maybe they'd rather run their own service. Or maybe if they uh, uh, talk to Google Stadia, they're not satisfied that Google's offering them enough money. But I, again, I think this uh, at some point would cause Google to decide it's acquire some of these companies. Got it. So last question for you, Trip. just looking back over your career, if you were to think about maybe one of the biggest lessons that you've learned that could apply to current folks in our industry today, what would you say that that lesson would be? You know, as I, as I look back on, on my life, I uh, realized that there were lots that I, I felt and I knew about myself from a very young age that turned out to be true. Picture yourself as a five-year-old. You know, you don't have a lot of earlier memories uh, and you, you haven't been in school yet. And so you have I've had a limited amount of, of environmental influence and training and yet you know things about yourself already. And you have a sense of things that you're good at some abilities that you have where you're better than other people. And you, you can see that in, in uh, comparison. You know, it might be athletic things. It might be uh, different parts of the schoolwork you have to do. It might be your hobby interests or how you express yourself artistically. But those are things that are obviously kind of built into you at a very fundamental, if you're able to notice them that young. And to give you an idea, I pretty much knew by the time I was five or six years old, I knew pretty creative. I knew I was uh, pretty artistic, but even more so, I knew I was a strategic thinker. I knew I was capable of leading people and that I had the courage to do it. And I kept seeing situation after situation where I found that I was the one who had the most capacity for responsibility, even in comparison to the adults that I was sometimes around. And uh, I've occasionally asked other entrepreneurs that have built successful companies, I would say to them, so how old were you when you figure out, figured out that you were the most responsible person in your family? And uh, I would always get answers back like five, six. <laughs> so this is a message for everyone, which is that the most you could possibly live is the one where you are the best version of yourself not trying to be somebody else, but trying to be the best version of yourself. And to do that and have the most fun, you're going to want to activate those abilities that have always been built into you that you sense are there when you, when, when you think back on your childhood. This could even include references to what you, what you uh, remember about your parents in childhood that was good. Uh, what did you admire about them? What, what of their traits or features or things they did did you... Uh, resonate with. Same thing with how you think about your earliest heroes. You know, one of my earliest heroes was uh, the uh, baseball player, Willie Mays. And of course, he had to come into baseball uh, at, at a time when uh, he was a pioneering black athlete dealing with a lot of racism. And he was very young and, uh, you know, had to uh, kind of go into a big city environment and deal with the media. And the guy had such a great combination of 
passion and determination to succeed this at the same time as having a really happy-go-lucky, light-hearted attitude. And, and again, that was really appealing to me as a, as a young child, and he's always been a hero. So why do we resonate with our heroes? You know, what is it that we have learned about our parents and grandparents that we have the most admiration for, that feels the most like us, something that we want to carry on? It's like these are these abilities that we have. And I'll give you a simple example. I think every person alive today has a tremendous amount of toughness, but not everybody gets that activated. And of course, uh, you know, if, if, if you grow up as a prince in a kingdom, you might only understand your toughness if you go down the path of uh, that fairy tale called The Prince and the Pauper, where the prince trades place with a poor kid and grows up because of it. And having that experience outside the castle of, wow, a whole new world opens up and uh, that prince had no idea how tough they were and what they were really capable of. I don't think any of us really knows how much we are capable of, but the best version of yourself fully activates, able to do that fits you perfectly, that uh, is exciting for you to do because you're being in yourself and is something that, are, you know, is a set of things, not just one thing, that you probably do better than the average human being, and that's who you really are. And that's the perfect way to get that life uh, work balance because it allows you to have your work be more like play. And again, I'm all about the play. <laughs> all right, Trip. Well, thank you very much for your time. Um, before we leave, do you have any last message for the audience or how could they get in touch with you or follow you on social media, for example? Yeah, thanks for asking. Uh, you know, I've only really started to do social media in the last year. I now have a, I have a Facebook fan page uh, that's uh, in my name. Uh, it's got lots of members. Uh, uh, you know, you, it's hard to be Facebook friends with me because I've already maxed that out at the uh, upper limit of 5,000 friends. Wow. And, uh, and then I'm also in LinkedIn, just under my, under my name. And then uh, on Instagram, I'm the Trip Hawkins. But you'd be surprised how many people are out there uh, uh, pretending to be me. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I think if you find your way to my actual account, you'll see you can recognize. All right. And I'll put links in the show notes to, uh, to, to all those things that you mentioned. But cool. great. It was awesome to have you on trip. And thank you very much for all the words of advice and for, um, for, for the comments. Thank you, Trip. Yeah, it's really my pleasure to be uh, re really enjoyed the interview. And happy gaming, everyone. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>